I wish good things to you who is watching this. I am Alexi, that Eastern European guy, and I'm going to be talking a lot today, so I've timestamped the video for you in the description. There is a common belief that great works of art are a result of inexplicable genius or otherworldly inspiration, and there is certainly some truth to that. However, there are also directly observable reasons why some music works and some music doesn't. The reasons are not specific to a certain style or genre, but the focus of today's video is going to be the famous Estonian Arvo Pert. Not only because he happens to be one of my favorite living composers, but also because his style is the clearest example of the point I'll be trying to get across. First, we're gonna try to understand Arvo Pert's style. See what makes Pert. Then we'll try to pinpoint the things that make millions of listeners connect with his music. And finally see if we can generalize these things across different styles and genres. To make this as clear as possible, I will avoid music theory. The most sophisticated terms I'll be using is major and minor, so as long as you're familiar with these two, you'll be fine. Also, I don't want to analyze any particular piece by Arvo Pert. Such YouTube videos already exist and I'm interested in general patterns outside the specific melody of an individual work. That said, I recently made a little musical tribute for Arvo Pert's 85th birthday, which you're hearing right now. And because it doesn't use Pert's melodies, but only his abstract composition principles, deconstructing it would be a good starting point for explaining how I understand Pert's style. And for that, I'm gonna need to stop talking for a while and start with this. For this step, I will have to start talking again, because the choice of note that we leave in the left hand makes all the difference. I could choose one at random like this. It doesn't sound that bad, but it's not particularly deep or memorable and not something Arvo Pert would do. In fact, he follows a strict rule about this. For the left hand, pick the highest possible note from the A minor chord that is still lower than the note in the right hand. So, if your right hand note is C, your left hand note should be A, because that's the closest you can get to a C without actually hitting a C. If your right hand note is D, then your left hand note should be C, which again is the closest possible, and so on. If we apply this to the happy birthday tune, it starts sounding something like this. This is already a bit more interesting. There is some logic and some depth to it, and that's because this simple rule has various and complex consequences. First, the very fact that the left hand is limited to the three notes of the A minor chord already makes us perceive the music as logically consistent. It is important that the A minor chord appears only in the secondary melody, which is hidden underneath the main melody of the right hand. So chances are you don't even hear that A minor chord explicitly, unless you're trained for it. I know I didn't before I actually started analyzing these works. Instead, for me as a listener, it just creates a general feel that every note belongs where it is and just sounds like it makes sense and is at peace with all the other notes. The second consequence is best felt if you use a scale pattern in the main melody, like Arvo Pert often actually does in his work. So if I play a C major scale, and then apply this rule, you can see how the left hand note repeats for two or three times in a row, stuttering in one place, 
and then jumps over its head trying to catch up with the right hand, but never quite succeeds in doing so. The implication here is that the energy changes at different rates in different voices. In the left hand, the energy changes are slower but starker, while in the right hand, the increase of intensity as we go up is more moderate and more consistent. For the listener, this results in a sense of depth and multifacetedness. This effect is not unique to Parts music, but it's certainly rare to find it achieved with such a small number of notes. The third and my favorite consequence is how the clashes of neighboring notes create these temporary mild dissonances. It sounds even better if you add a third voice that moves parallel to the main melody. This gives us three dissonant chords in the scale. This one, this one, and this one. They are dissonant, but are not overly dissonant, and that's for two reasons. First, they are similar to each other in the fact that the dissonance in all three of them stems from playing two notes that are too close together. And through this similarity, these three chords create a logical narrative on their own, so they're easier to follow. And more importantly, they're sandwiched in between consonant chords, so any arising tension is ultimately released. If you are a person who likes reading into things, you could say they are dissonant enough to remind you of the imperfections of the real world, but consonant enough to prevent you from feeling desperate about it. So, you hear a sense of logical coherence, a sense of depth and multi-layeredness, as well as consistent alternation between consonants and mild dissonance, and all these happen to be a direct and natural consequence of this one small mathematical rule. I say mathematical, not as a metaphor. Having the left hand depend on the right hand in this way follows the definition of a mathematical function. The interesting part is that the composer abides by this rule in all of his famous works from the late 70s and 80s without exception. What makes these works different from one another is the imaginative ways in which this rule is applied. And also, Arvo Pert does allow alternative versions of this rule. For example, in some pieces, instead of choosing the highest possible note for the secondary melody, he goes for the one that's second highest. But once he makes this change, he tends to keep it consistent throughout the work, or at least make sure that any further variation or additional layers of complexity to the rule result in a secondary melody that can be described as a mathematical function of the main melody. In some works, such as Kansas in Memoriam Benjamin Britten and Spiegel im Spiegel, Arvo Pert goes further and derives every aspect of the music algorithmically to the point that the sheet music could literally be replaced with a few lines of code without any loss of information. You may be thinking that all this algorithmic stuff doesn't mean much because the main appeal of Pert's music is in its emotional component. And indeed, the top comments on his YouTube videos tend to be deeply personal and describe the listener's strong emotional responses. I argue that a large part of this emotionality stems from the aforementioned musical consequences of that one simple mathematical function. Of course, it only partially accounts for the power of his music's impact, leaving room for this mysterious composer intuition that everybody likes to romanticize. The main rule of Arvo Pert's style allows for some arbitrariness. You get to choose the main melody however you like, and once you've locked in the choice, it's the secondary melody that is algorithmically derived. It seems to me that it is this balance of heart and brain that makes his music so good. It sounds obvious and cheesy once I've said it, because everybody's heard about the heart part. But I made this video because so many people tend to forget about the brain part or not notice the connection between the two. I've seen way too many composers mindlessly slap a few nice sounding chords together, resulting in music that is okay to listen to in the moment, you know, because the chords are indeed nice, but completely forgettable on the next day. 
There isn't anything in their deep structure that has any shot of influencing the listener on some unconscious level. When you deeply analyze great works of music, not just those by Arvo Pert, what you often find is a rationally constructed component that is complex enough to be hidden from the listener, but simple enough to cause audible, emotionally impactful musical consequences. The celestially crystal sound of Messiaen's piano is made possible by his modes of limited transposition, and the lush richness of Magnus Lindbergh's orchestral works are ultimately a result of combining a few uniquely arranged 12-note chords. So everybody who knows what they're doing has their own technical thing, it's just that Arvo Pert's thing stands out with its extraordinary simplicity. It's actually fascinating how nobody thought of it in the centuries-long history of classical music, but there might be an explanation for that too. It wasn't until his 40s that Arvo Pert came up with the technique that he's famous for. Before that, he composed musically and mathematically complex works that sounded tumultuous and dissonant. I'm not going to put them in this video, but I left some listening recommendations in the description. It seems to me that experience in taming musical complexity could be a prerequisite to mastering consonants, because Arvo Pert's lesser known but still very good composer colleagues, who came up with their own version of simplicity, also started out as modernist hardliners. It's almost as if they found that one simple thing that works for their music by brute forcing every conceivable stylistic option. So there you have it. Be talented, explore experimental styles, do that for 40 years, discover a seemingly dry technical thing that happens to have deep musical consequences, find imaginative ways to apply it, do it for another 15 years, and you're good to go. This is what I see as a crucial yet sometimes overlooked component of good music. The topic is of course more complicated than that, and my answer is only partial, and any possible answer could be only partial, so please let me know what I missed and what you think about this, I am more than happy to have a discussion about that in the comments. I'm going to leave you with this last small thing. You may have noticed that the background music for this video was mostly nursery rhymes harmonized in the style of Arvo Pert. So if you happen to be lucky enough to have some basic piano skills, you could have fun like this with any tune you like. In fact, Pert's compositional technique is so powerful that it can even make a bouncy pop song sound reflective and profound. 